I'm Dan Snow. Welcome to Voices of the First World War. In the years leading up to the centenary of the war, the last of those who actually experienced it have passed away. But the Imperial War Museums and the BBC had recorded interviews with many veterans to try to capture what it was like to actually be there. This series listens to those stories. A, a gas bottle like those oxygen cylinders, you know, that sort of thing. About three foot high. Iron things, and very heavy and very awkward. And we laboriously tilted these things up into the front line and sacked them in traverses along the front line, ready to be used when the attack was opened. The ideal wind was between southwest and west. Well, I forecasted that the wind would change during the night, and by midnight it was blowing from west. But it was very much lighter than we had expected it to be. And Sir Douglas Haig said to the gas advisor, well, they won't let it off if the wind isn't favourable, will they? And the gas advisor said, that those are their instructions, sir. In September 1915, the British prepared to unleash a new weapon in their largest battle yet on the Western Front. It was a battle that was fought against the backdrop of the town of Luce, a flat landscape dominated by German-held mining villages, slag heaps and colliery towers. Sir Douglas Haig asked me, well, now, what do you advise? I naturally said that I thought that my job was restricted to telling him what conditions were expected. And he said, well, somebody's got to make the decision. And I said, well, in view of all the conditions, I think uh, it should be as soon as possible. There was a tower in the chateau to which he went and went up to the top of the tower to see how things were looking. And so he then gave instructions for the attack to be just after 5 a.m. Why? God alone knows. But the fact remains that they did release that gas in the loose attack, and a lot of our people got their own stuff. The British attack was part of a much bigger picture, with the Allies hitting both sides of a bulge in the line that pointed towards Paris. The French would attack in Artois, the British commanders on the ground did not want to attack at Luce, where the terrain favoured the Germans, but Lord Kitchener overruled them, and he ordered them to accept, if necessary, very heavy losses indeed at Luce. It was part of a big push from all Allied nations. It couldn't be reversed now. We had a padre, you know, who preached to us on Sundays. I remember him saying, by next Sunday, Many of you will have ceased to exist, which I thought was a cheerful note to strike. But against that, I'm bound to say that when the battle was on, he was in and out carrying people, carrying people, carrying people. So he quitted himself well. The shortage of artillery shells in 1915 meant that the opening bombardment to cut the German wire and soften up their defences would not be as strong as was required. So for the first time, the British were using poison gas. There was a strong smell of gas in Luz at the time when we attacked. Which gas was it? Can you remember? Chlorine. To our right was Luz itself, and to our left was Hullock, which was our objective. Well, it was rather a terrifying sight from the front line because going away in front of us, up for a sheer almost 800 yards, and an incline all the way right to the German trenches with barbed wire in between. And that's what the infantrymen had to face. There was a, a shaft, I suppose you'd call it, sticking up in the air, and they called that Tower Bridge. And we could see that icing a mile before we got to it. And that was the, the place we had to kind of march on. Our platoon officer gave us our orders. I was to lead a section up a sap, turn to the right and lie down, and wait for my fellow corporal on the right. He said that if anyone turned back, he would be waiting with his revolver so that uh, if we didn't go one way, we wouldn't go the other. So our captain, Lucas, waving his sword, said, charge. And we got up on top. Well, you could hear your bullets whizzing, whistling by ears, I might say, but uh, as long as they didn't hit you, you were all right. And our infantrymen, all clad in these Ku Klux Klan helmets, went off. A lot of them thought that they were suffocating, 
and they pulled the helmets off. Just at that moment, the wind decided to change and the gas, instead of going over the German trenches, remained stationary and, if anything, came back towards the infantry. There were also a section of wire which had not been cut and there were dead Highland line and infantry still hanging on the wires. Well, I went over the first and second line of trenches and I got right up and an officer came down and he said, where are you going? I said, well, I said, I've got to lay a wire to the crossroads, Hullock. He said, you better, go off. you better get off back, he said. We haven't captured it yet, so back we had to go and I wasn't sorry either. I think our heaviest casualties were just as, as we were moving up to Hill 70 from the village, which is a matter of perhaps 100, 150 yards. And that's when the machine gunners were mowing us down. There was an enormous German ahead of us, people handing him bombs with both hands and he was throwing them at us. And uh, the man next to me had half his head shot off. But I went on. He had so many machine guns on it, and everything and everybody moved, they were fired at. When we got there, the Germans had cleared off. The majority of them did fall back. The battle lasted four days. Getting toward night time, eight o'clock at night, it was dark, and we were actually laying just above the village, almost into some old German dugouts. Jerry was firing these very lights to see who was moving about. If he saw anybody moving about, he'd got a machine gun, he'd turn it on them, you see. One of these very lights came straight down the, on my back, and I had a haversack on my back, and it burned a hole straight through the haversack. And I didn't move in case Jerry put his machine gun on me, but fortunately it burnt out, or else I couldn't have done much about it. And I have a sort of recollection in the dark uh, going up a pavé road with the, the French trees that there were line, poplars that lined these roads stuck up and a lot of them sheared off with shell fire and you could hear the smack of the bullet on these these trees, you know, that sort of thing. I spent uh, one night crouching in a dugout with an enormous German sitting on a box, dead as mutton, and uh, we went another night without food, without drink, and without any communications, and getting very cold, and very thirsty, and very hungry, and very tired. Luce saw the first large-scale use of Kitchener's so-called New Army, made up of the vast numbers of volunteers that had enlisted and been training since August 1914. Jim Davis was among them. He recalled the scene of terrible destruction, in conversation years later with Peter Hart of the Imperial War Museum. The first thing I saw in the morning were wounded jocks coming down, ambulances to start with, motor ambulances, then horse ambulances, and then walking wounded. I never saw so many wounded jocks. Did you talk to them? Did you ask them what was happening? I don't know. One of, I always remember one of the chaps saying, uh, is it always like this up here? And the chap said, no, only on Saturdays. I remember this, the jock said. We hadn't got a clue what it was in. We thought of it, this, this was war, that's how we went in. We went right into the Battle of Blues. It's the first time I'd seen so many dead men. There was one platoon that had been machine gunned and they were just lying right, like so many sardines in a tin. As I went over some time later, we got to a sap that led straight up into the German trenches and at the head of that sap, there was a German machine gunner handcuffed to his machine gun. Now, down by the side of him, there seemed to be thousands and thousands of cartridge cases. And in front of him, all the way up that sap, I saw our dead fellows. He caused terrible execution. Of course, those lads weren't moved for some days. And for days after, when I was laying that wire out, I had to pass over those bodies the British did capture the village of Luce, taking the German first line. But more defences lay ahead, and the British were unable to break through. William Hildred spoke to Lynn Smith of the Imperial War Museum in 1985. Was there much debris about? Debris? Millions and millions of tonnes of it. 
dead men largely, legs and arms, bodies built into a trench, a slaughter of young men that was indescribable. There's no question about it. Ask anybody who knew about it. Uh, I, I would say that in my particular uh, platoon, 90% of them were killed at the end of the Battle of Luce. And uh, the losses were, I think, on that scale. But if some historian gives you a different figure, you believe him, don't believe me. It's a long time ago. The evening burial parties were a feature which went on for several months before the battlefields were finally cleared up. George Craik served as an officer in the Highland Light Infantry at Luce. Under cover of darkness, each unit took turns to help in the disposal of the dead. There were 60,000 casualties in the British Army alone. Each party, on all fours, dealt with the dead by simply pulling them into depressions in the earth or into shell holes. This was not a pleasant task, and occasionally the arms disintegrated from the bodies. The bodies were covered over with a light layer of earth so that the work was slow and difficult. Before the bodies were actually covered over, the main task was to retrieve the identity discs. These discs were found round their necks and were cut off. I had to get their belongings, list them, send them home to the people, and um, that was a sad job, sending home the things which were on a dead man. Yeah. Well, generally speaking, everybody had, had lost one of their pals or friends, you know, in the attack and who had not returned, so you, you kind of wrote them off and say they'd gone and uh, wanted a bit of cheering up. And uh, when we got back there, a Captain Morrison, who was in charge of the battalion, then got the general service wagons to go to a brewery, and they brought two big barrels of beer, lit a huge bonfire in the school playground where we were billeted, and we all got round and started singing songs and drinking the beer, <laughs> just to liven us up a little bit. That sounds like it was reasonably effective from the way you tell it. Yes. Uh, he was a very fine man, was Captain Morrison. He had plenty of money, but I believe he was killed soon afterwards. The British Army attempted to learn from its experiences at Luce in planning for a major offensive in the summer of 1916. That attack, along the River Somme, would be a slaughter that dwarfed even Luce. It would be three appalling years before an offensive on the Western Front enjoyed the kind of enduring success that British commanders had hoped for at Luz. George Jameson. I can't remember anything after Luz. I can't remember any outstanding event at all that happened beyond just the humdrum of war. Will this never end? There was a hopeless sort of outlook of we're here for keeps. This is never going to change. 